yo, would you guys like to own a thing that represents you own part of No Interruption? Oh my God, that's my, my favorite song growing up. I don't want to own the vinyl. I want to own the song. When I think about what would make it valuable, it is how can I create a really unique experience and drive value back to fans. The idea of using blockchain technology to offer your fans, your supporters, actual ownership. Really, at the end of the day, it's about the fan to artist connection. Hey, Altcoin Daily audience. Today we interview Hoodie Allen, an American rapper, singer, songwriter, and an old friend of ours. In this interview, we talk Snoop Dogg, Steve Aoki, Blau, Gary Vee, crypto and NFTs, of course. Now, Hoodie Allen doesn't have an NFT project to sell you. He's here because we asked him to come on to give us his real thoughts as a popular musician on the NFT and cryptocurrency space. What do artists actually think of NFTs? Like I said, us and Hoodie, we go way back. So stay tuned at the end of this video. I include a little bit of us brawing out. Hit the like button and let's get right to Hoodie. Altcoin Daily audience, smash up that like button. Today we are joined by popular musical artist, rapper, music maker, Hoodie Allen. He's got a new album coming out March 17th called Bub. You know him for No Interruption, Cake Boy, Famous for Assholes. Those are my favorite songs. But Hoodie Allen, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Are we telling the audience that we go way back or are we keeping it a secret? Let's do it. We as go way back. As, as no transparent back. as the blockchain, baby. <laughs> as our audience knows, we're actors and filmmakers in Los Angeles. That was our first love. And we were actually in a couple Hoodie Allen music videos, movie and the one on the golf course. Show me what you're made of. Show me what you're made of. 2014. So nearly 10 years of, of knowing you guys. And um, it's really cool to be doing this. Not probably the collaboration that we expected uh, if you take 2014 version of ourselves. But here we are, ready to nerd it up on the interweb about some crypto. I know. So cool. Austin, before I jump in. Well, and by the way, speaking of that transition, like, dude, to me, you're you're an artist that grew through the ranks without a label, without signing to those big corporate entities. To me, that's a lot like the crypto story, you know, gathering a community on your own. Can you just go over your background and how you transcended or put out albums in music without those labels? Yeah, totally. So uh, what you said is right. I've sort of operated outside the traditional system. Most people think about, oh, you getting some popularity online, record labels start calling, you sign to a label, and then you're kind of in the, the music machine. I've, I've kind of operated outside of that, where uh, the internet was my fan base and my label and my everything. So, you know, it was the source where people found me and then would come see me in concert. And I've kind of done everything independently with without kind of the uh, record label. So it's, it's afforded me a lot of creativity and ownership over you know, the, the music that I've made and when I want to put things out. It's also, I think, been instrumental in terms of building that community that you speak to, which I think is one of the most important things that an artist can kind of have, which is a, is a community that matters to them and, um, and that they can build that isn't sort of beholden to even the social media entities, you know, so building that sort of thing outside of the traditional framework has been hugely a, a good like learning lesson in all business. Definitely. And before we jump into like your thoughts on NFTs or what the music industry or your friends think of NFTs, because obviously in the past few years, Snoop Dogg, Steve Aoki, Sia, Kings of Leon, they've all gotten into some extent or another, certainly Snoop Dogg and Steve Aoki to the top people as far as popular music and NFTs. But before we get to that, can you just uh, give us now your experience in crypto? Have you ever bought any crypto? What are your thoughts? I have a ledger. That means I'm serious. <laughs> I have a cold, hard wallet, whatever you call it. Um, I I was talked in the talked into. I was definitely on the sidelines for a while. Um, well, I think back in twenty, I want to say back in twenty sixteen, I was on tour in Europe, and people were talking about Bitcoin, and I remember buying uh, some Bitcoin plus really like weird altcoins on Binance. And I've subsequently forgotten my Binance password. And even though every once in 10 months, I think I can crack this, I can figure this out. It never works. So luckily, I don't think that was too big of an investment. I think it was under $1,000, but still, it's gone. That That is gone. Since then, I got a little smarter um, and tried to take advice from my friends who are kind of more experienced in the space 
um, and learn more, do a little more of my own like research online and, and feel it out. And I started uh, mo- mostly just kind of investing in Bitcoin, um, you know, like a little bit every week. Um, and I do have some Ethereum as well. And I do have a few NFTs, although uh, I, I, have dif- I definitely have different opinions on different aspects of the crypto space, especially how it translates to artists and, and what I do as well, because there's a lot of potential. I'm sure we'll get into it. Yeah, let's jump right in, because that's what I want to know, because we talk about what crypto can do. We bring people on the, the promise of NFTs, the promise of crypto, but you're actually in the music industry. Some yeah. people in the music industry are into it. Some people are against it. Um, so I don't know, where should we start? I mean, what's your understanding of uh, NFTs or, or digital collectibles? Do you see the 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 value in that or or no? Well, I'm a huge collectible guy in general. So like I even during the, the pandemic, I kind of found myself um, starting a collection with sports cards, which is, I guess, a, a physical collectible, right? And the tangible value that's held in that is mostly tied to a mix of gambling, if you're talking about people who are active players, or nostalgia. Hey, I grew up with this team. This team matters to me. This player matters to me. That's why I want to own this card. Um, when it comes to NFTs, I think the the there are some similarities with like you know you take it back to uh, CryptoPunks, right? Some some of the reason or the staying power of CryptoPunks kind of exists in that same long form of like, hey this is the first of something and that's why it's going to matter long term but i guess the downside and this is kind of in any unregulated space is uh there's a lot of room for like grifting and 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 like kind of making value out of thin air so i like believe full-heartedly in like the human tribalism of like i like this and so i wear this hat that is this and this represents me but sometimes we've sort of created uh value out of thin air when it maybe doesn't exist and i think some crypto projects as the market has gotten cooled off a little bit um people aren't talking about them you know and they've kind of i don't know if they've gone to zero but they've gone the volume and the price has gone down considerably you're- and especially in 2021, that was the hype. This was healthy in a sense to to clean out and see who's still standing and if, if this technology is actually valuable and i hear all the time from artists that plain and simple, the hope with NFTs is it offers a more direct line of communication and community to your audience. Do you, I know artists have released their full albums as NFTs, they're trying it out. Do you see that as like the most viable use case as an artist? Well, I th- I think there's, I think there's some real interesting, I like when I, when I think about what would make it valuable, it is how can I create a really unique experience and drive value back to fans. And there are some aspects in like sort of the web three space that just aren't maybe created yet or potentially ready yet. where trying to create that, that wedge and that value feels a little bit like Oregon trail where we're like, we're on like the, we're on like the, uh, the horse and buggy and we have no one's driving a Tesla yet to make it the super easy connection. But I keep I, dying I, of dysentery. Yeah, you just, you just, the dysentery gets you every time. You're like, what the hell? Um, like, it's interesting. A friend of mine, um, Blau, who is sort of like, you know, uh, he's a DJ and kind of like one of the early people to kind of connect the music and NFTs. He has a company called Royal. Are you guys familiar with Royal? Definitely. And Blau, a little bit. Yeah. Royal was an idea that I had in my head that he, beat me to and I was like damn it this is such a good idea which is sort of um the idea of using blockchain technology to offer your fans your supporters actual ownership physical tangible ownership interest in your music and then being able to kind of also create a secondary market where those shares of the music that are represented by the NFTs can be sold and traded. Now, I don't really know how much I feel about that secondary market versus the ownership model, but the ownership model that feels like such a collectible. It's like saying, Hey, yo, would you guys like to own a thing that represents you own part of no interruption? Oh my God. That's my, my favorite song growing up. I want to, I don't want to own the vinyl. I want to own the song. Right. 
And the thing that I'm still trying to figure out, cut me off if I'm being too rambly, is I'm not sure yet if these are investment vehicles or collectibles. And I think there's maybe things that need to be, you know, ironed out in that regard because I they feel a little bit more like um, a collectible that doesn't necessarily going to derive you profit as opposed to something that you're doing to make money on. And maybe that's a good thing, but uh, definitely would love your thoughts on all that. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm feeling what you're saying. I think also in 2021, besides just straight up bad ideas, just the whole market got overvalued. So even if there was a good idea, if it goes down such a large percent, people just get like burnt out and they don't, you know, really aren't, aren't as into it as much. I think when we're talking about NFTs as straight up collectibles versus investment vehicles, well, straight up collectibles, I think it's a it's going to be a natural part of our future. I think the world is only trending more digital. I mean, when we were kids, it was just starting to get really digital. People were just starting to get online. In a hundred years, it's only going to become more easy. And every you know, humans are into collectibles. You're in, into collectibles. I'm into collectibles. Sure. Yeah. If you drop like um, an album that's a collectible or or a T-shirt, those things can get knocked off like crazy. Now, if you drop a digital collectible, now you have the verifiable proof that this is the actual one. And that you know may not be a big deal to some people now, but as the world trends more and more digital, you know, if you if you have a collectible, your baseball cards in your house, what if 20 of your friends see that the whole year? If that, maybe it's just you and your girlfriend or your one friend who ever saw that the whole year. But if you have a digital collectible and more and more friendships and communities are happening online, you know, soon hundreds, thousands, millions of your friends can see that. And it just creates, you know, a greater you know, it creates that community online as, as people, you know, move online. That's what I think as far as collectibles go. Yeah, it's it's super interesting. It's also funny because when you look at all these things like art and things that are kind of considered like high end and collectible in nature, oftentimes they're meant to be put away almost in a sense. Like people don't even, they like put their art, their high value art in like storage somewhere because they don't want to show it off. And it's, it's almost like a bragging rights thing. But I, yeah, I, I think... Anything that can drive, like as as a musician, I always want to think about this stuff because really at the end of the day, it's about the fan to artist connection. And that's how I've sort of grown everything for myself. And the idea of, and, and, and maybe this is where more of my interest would lie in the future, is kind of like the, I guess the concept of like a DAO, right? And empowering your fans to have impactful decision-making um almost like rights within your community and how can that be represented? I, I, I assume, you know, that's where the blockchain kind of comes into place to create like, Hey, well, we can, this person's part of this and they've participated and they bought this or ha however it works, or maybe you're giving it away for free to your thousand biggest fans. It doesn't all always have to be about commerce, but it is really about creating that, that relationship that could potentially live offline and not be, I know right now, like the main thing is like Discord, but Discord is still like Web 2, right? I mean, that relationship is still kind of owned by a third company. There's not really a, it's it's great, but it's not direct. If Discord disappears, how do you connect to those people? And you're totally right. I think with, you know, what the blockchain I think will do, it's not as if, you know, the blockchain, you know, it's not magic. Obviously, we all know that. It just creates, you can verifiably prove that you bought the album back in the day, that you were at the concert back in the day. And it really relies on how much the artists or the author or the publisher cares to, you know, do things for the fans. You've always been super fan oriented. Every concert is like, hey, whoever buys the first T-shirt, let's take pictures. Let's do all this stuff. And it is so really just the blockchain. It gives you that verifiable proof. And even, you know, years later and, uh, you know, not to mention if you're dropping another digital collectible or something, you can just send it right to their wallet. Uh, yeah. Very easy. I, I, I think that that prolonged continued connection where you're thinking about how can I reward these people for, you know, their loyalty or, you know, you can create games around it or just like the community building in general, as long as you're thinking of ways to uniquely um, provide value to people and make them feel special. That's what it is at the end of the day, you know, and there's probably, you know, like I, I see it as like, you know, maybe the new form of fan club. And I, I think like a fa fan clubs in general have existed since, I don't know, probably the 80s, maybe beforehand, where you'd, you'd pay a certain amount yearly for a subscription and then you'd get these things in the mail or you'd be part of this list. But 
and like you said, we're tra- as we trend digital, some of those, some of the ways that you know will contract in the future are going to feel more commonplace to like, oh, I don't want to do this here. I want to do this online. I want to do this in my wallet. Everyone has a wallet on their phone. And we just, we just have to get to that place. Right. And I actually think Steve Aoki out of all the people we named, I mean, from what I've seen in his interviews, I think, you know, he truly does it the best. I'm not necessarily in the Steve Aoki NFT community, but the way he talks about it, he is, you know, this tier system, the kind of like a doubt what you were talking about, this tier system for his NFTs and some of the, some of the people he's meeting up with, some of the people they're helping him craft the songs. Who was it Blau or who is the, you know, the big person in the past couple of years, we were like, wow, they're getting into it. Well, maybe this is uh, maybe I have to take a second look at this. Uh, I mean, you know, it's interesting because <laughs> uh, the, the NFT space is, has a lot of good marketers in it. Right. So, and sometimes you have to filter through it where it's like, okay. Um, because you know, there's, there's, there's marketing that comes from um, real genuine passion from it. Sometimes there's marketing that comes from, I don't want to call it scams, but you know, people who under promise or under deliver, but see a, a way to make, uh, you know, a quick cash. I, I, I think um, even if I was to point to someone, I, th- I think Gary V is probably the, maybe the, the best person who's in terms of community building that I've seen. And I think some of the, my fellow musicians have maybe some somehow done the worst job occasionally because they're just, because they're just being told, Hey, do this this equals money and they don't really understand it. So they're, they're not in it for the long term. And I, I think with someone like Gary V, um, it seems like, I don't know, like personally, I don't know that V friends is the vision that he sees it in terms of its um, mainstream crossover appeal. I don't know, but I know that, I know that he's trying. And he's trying to integrate in all those sort of ways so that if you are a first time believer in him, he's going to keep trying. And if it doesn't work, he he's not going to abandon and pivot to something new just for another cash grab, which is kind of what maybe the influencer marketing space generally goes to. It's like, oh, shit, that flopped. Well, I'll just create another thing, leave those people behind, and maybe I can get another people to get in on this. This will be the one, you know. So I admire that aspect for sure. I definitely look at Gary as an example of one of the guys doing it right out of all this unknown technology, unknown way to do it. He's paving the way for sure. One of my final questions, and this is just sort of like in summation, we kind of already touched on some of this as a musician right now out there doing it. What's like a pain point stopping you today from, from launching NFTs for your community? Yeah, that's a great question. I I think it, it comes down to two things for me. The, the first one is um, I care a lot about um, the the well being of of that audience and who could possibly get it. So I, I'd I'd rather take a little bit more time to do something right than to do something and lose trust because you don't you can't regain that trust if if someone decides to you know kind of put their trust in you and usually one of the ways is saying hey I'm investing in you or an idea that you have or an album. Um, that's that's special and you don't want to like kind of break that trust because you know i'm sure there are a lot of people who got into crypto or the nft space for the first time at the height of it lost money and it's going to be very hard to get those people back you know if they're for if their one and only experience in it is like negative that that that's tough that it's it's tough to re-engage those people and convince them that like oh hey this is why that happened and it will be better trust me sort of next time so there's there's that bit of just wanting to do things right and diligently and then the second part is, I think it's, it's just, you know, still not um, as easily adoptable for people as, and I, I don't know what the pinpoint is on that and what the change is, and I'd love to pick your brain on it. But until, it, until the point where everyone just understands how to use a MetaMask or there's a better tool or, you know, like until it gets to that point where it's, where it's easy, I think there's going to be some... Uh, hesitance for for launching full on in and you know that that adoption process obviously takes a while like my dad recently in the last two years he's on spotify he's got spotify on his phone that's how he listens to music he doesn't listen to the radio anymore i was on spotify 10 years before he was on spotify right but now he's there and he's adopted it and he would never go back to to listening to the radio in his car he doesn't and we need that same change for 
the space where it just becomes easier. It's just once, once my dad is in there, then I know we're there. You know what I mean? Mr. Allen, keep us updated. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh yeah. yeah I'm, talking, I'm talking to your dad. I'm talking to your dad. <laughs> He's Mr. Allen. Oh, true. Yes. Mr. <laughs> Allen, please stay, get a, get a, get your shit together. <laughs> right. I'm sure that's what his dad goes by. But, uh, um, my final question, Hoodie, is, uh, you know, tell us about this album. Um, it's been a little bit since you released an album. We're looking forward to it. It's called Bub, correct? Tell yes. us about it. Um, well, it's a little different than some of the stuff I've made in the past. I, I think people typically would associate me with like pop rap, you know, upbeat, fun stuff. This is a little bit more in the rock genre, a little bit more alternative and indie. Um, I wrote it about uh, the end of a relationship that I had. And I kind of, you know, spill my guts a little bit more, but it's still uh, catchy and fun. So I think if you've, if you've liked my music in the past, hopefully you'll enjoy this. And maybe if you're someone who kind of likes maybe a little bit more indie alternative rock stuff, this could be a nice entry point to, yeah, check it out. What's the number one song people, you know, want from you? In, in what, in, at a concert in general? Yeah, in general, or yeah, come up to you or at a concert. Oh gosh, it's hard. You know the uh, it, it's. I just I just got back from a tour in Europe, and I was very surprised because the most the most popular songs were obviously sort of like the classics, like the No Faith in Brooklyn, No Interruption from like my first album, but also some of the new stuff that are going to be on this album, like a song called Hey Ben and Happy Again. Those were like the loudest received songs. So it's really cool to kind of watch um, an audience grow with you. And stick with you and that's you know that's like the the greatest like gift you could ask for as an artist i like tay ben it reminded me of scotty doesn't know from euro trip just you know a little bit just 100%. A, little bit. <laughs> a, little, a nicer version of it perhaps yeah totally uh, all right hoodie thank you so much for coming on final thoughts for the altcoin daily audience yeah um i'm gonna be tuning in if you're not subscribed and you're watching this subscribe i'm plugging i'm plugging the subscriptions right now and yeah, I'm excited to see where the space goes. I think there's, I think, you know, it's all about patience because I think change takes time and uh, don't, you know, be in it for the long run. That's how, that's, that's how everything works in life. See, zoom out a little bit and, and that's how you really find the, the value in what you do. Awesome. Thanks so much for coming on today, Hoodie. You know what? I'll, I'll get the NFT as soon as you drop it. Can't wait. You'll, you'll, I'll put you on the whitelist. <laughs> he knows all the terminology. He named MetaMask. He named Ledger. <laughs> all right, cool. no, and no sponsorships. It's just, it's just what I know. Yeah, nice. for sure. Thank you all guys right. so much. What's up, boys? Good to see you. What's, What's up, up, man? To Great to well. see you. Appreciate you taking um, the time. Of course, man. I've been interacting with your account without knowing that it was you guys for however long that that's been. Wait, are you wearing a Happy Camper t-shirt? I was there, dude, in Los Angeles. Well, yeah, I, you've been there way before it, the Happy Camper uh, era, so. Yeah, but I got the shirt at the concert. I think it was probably in 2016-ish. It was definitely in 2016-ish. Thanks so much. That's awesome. Yeah, great show. Ed Sheeran came out. I think Black Bear might have been there. I can't remember, but yeah, it was great. Uh, Black Bear had not left the tour yet. No, yeah. no controversy had happened. Oh, and, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, Ed, but Ed Sheeran came out too. That was so fun. Oh, my God. Yeah, that was really fun. I've never heard it. I thought, that, you know, the crowd gets loud and you never hear a crowd get louder in my life than Ed Sheeran coming out. I was like, oh, you guys suck for me. This is <laughs> Yeah, what? they went crazy. But the whole crazy. thing was good. I remember somebody was like, play James Franco. And you're like, does the band even know that? that the drummer starts, you know, doing a beat and you did James Franco is dope. Yeah, our our little fake spontaneity it wasn't fake, but you're oh, like, oh, wasn't? no, no, oh, it, wasn't. it was, it, it was definitely spo spontaneous. I'm just, kidding. you know, you're like, oh, I don't know how I'll ever do this, but and then you just <laughs> for sure, I'm a pro. I can make this happen. <laughs> are we are we recording? Do you want to set it up? How you want to do this? Yeah, we are, but we probably won't use any of that. Although the Ed Sheeran story was great, or the you know the vibing or the remembering. Feel free to repurpose however you'd like. 